Well, welcome back. We're joined in the studio with the producers of this new film, State of Mind. It's a documentary available from InfoWarsStore.com. It's pre-booking now. We'll have an exclusive on it for the first few months. It looks like a great documentary. And uh, you can get also The American Dream, which is an animated film that explains a lot of the details of the banking system that we're strapped under. And I'm looking forward to really seeing State of Mind. I've just seen some clips from it, but we're going to talk to the producers of that here. We've got Austin Green and Chris Emery joining us here. Now, Austin, you also did editing on the film, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. It's, a, it's a great film. You know, it, it surprised me a little bit because the first thing we think about when we think of mind control, of course, is what's come to revelation in just the last few years about the CIA experiments after World War II and going on to the current day. But you take a much broader approach to this. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, you know, whenever we first developed the concept for this film, you know, we had several different approaches that we could have gone with it. And we didn't really want to repeat what had been done. There's so many other great filmmakers and uh, artists out there who have put out information like, like this. Uh, Scott Noble uh, created a film called Human Resources, which uh, you know heavily influenced us and in, in, uh, you know the approach to this film. But you know, we really wanted to take a broader approach and show how it all ties mm -hmm. many areas together mm -hmm. that, that create a you know a matrix of control. It's not you know one thing is controlling us or this thing is controlling us. It's putting all of these pieces together that, that create the framework that they, they control us. Yeah, you focus quite a lot on education, and that's something that uh, really got my interest because my wife had a master's degree in education. I remember when she was in school, she brought home B.F. Skinner's book, Beyond Freedom and Dignity, and I looked at it as like, it's about time somebody complains about the schools. Yeah, I had gone through the government schools, and, and uh, that was my time. She says, no, 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 you don't understand. He's talking about how to do this. And so that was my epiphany at that moment, seeing B.F. Skinner's book. And so we resolved that we were not going to put our kids through that system. And, uh, but th this is something that's been planned for a very long time. As a matter of fact, you go back all the way to Machiavelli, right? Yeah, I mean, the systems of control go back thousands of years, but uh, Machiavelli was an interesting character that, you know, really kind of crystallized how they were going to go about controlling the masses of people because, you know, at that time, you know, they didn't have gigantic armies or security forces, and so they had to rely more on psychological manipulation to keep the masses happy because, you know, as we all know from the French Revolution, you know, if you don't uh, keep a handle on that, uh, the yeah. people will rise up against you eventually. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you talk about the emperor having no clothes. I mean, the clothes <laughs> were a big part of the control that they exercised over people, having those special accoutrements. But, you know, we, we're talking about this now. You guys also worked on A Noble Lie, which is one of my favorite documentaries. I love to see. I knew when it came out. I had seen in the New American testimonies from the general who said this is not the blast pattern that you're going to see from a car bomb or a single bomb, even, for that matter. So I knew that it was a, a false flag operation. I had no idea of everything that was in it that you guys found. Great detective work. Thank you very much. We, uh, we were very honored to have the opportunity to do that. And uh, basically correlating with this, this movie, that was more of a, a microcosm of, of government corruption. And what we wanted to do with State of Mind Psychology of Control was take that to the next level and say, we asked ourselves, why aren't people asking questions? Mm -hmm. Why aren't they mm -hmm. awake? Mm -hmm. Why can't they see the larger picture? Mm -hmm. So State of Mind Psychology of Control is actually laying out the tools. It's more of a primer. It's, it's, it's a jump point for the uninitiated. And then, of course, folks like us that understand all this, it, it comes naturally. But we wanted to open that door for the folks that aren't aware of, of the principles that are from cradle to grave. How are you controlled from education to media to, um, you know, there is a lot of government corruption going on. Whether they want to admit it or not, uh, you know, as, as the citizen, yes, this is existing and this is how you can handle it. And then we offer solutions. We go that extra step. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, education is, like I said, such a key part of it. Let's take a look at that clip that you've got from the, uh, from the documentary here. The education our children is, are going to get has nothing to do with education. It is training uh, our children to be uh, resources, human resources, that's the way they refer to us, to spin off profits for the globalists. The greatest barrier to discovery is not ignorance. It's the illusion of knowledge, and that's what the 15,000 hours in compulsory schooling really entrains in, in and conditions into us, is that you've been told this story of the people in South America, 
And so you think you know about it. And it's not until later in life when you might come across more information about conquistadors and how Jesuits infiltrated all their religious systems and, and took all the riches out and basically harvested this whole area. This is an example of plunder in South America that went on for hundreds of years. So until you have this other piece of information to bring this into focus, you think that what you're taught in public schooling during that 15,000 hours is really what's going on. And it's not until you bump up to, against reality, as George Orwell said, on a, usually on a battlefield, that you have to consider that which you were taught to believe versus the objective evidence that exists. John Taylor Gatto was an award-winning educator in New York who took kids that couldn't even read or write or headed for prison and made them top-level students. And then he discovered that he was shut down by the big tax-free foundations so that he couldn't teach the children this information. And he discovered that it was by design that they were dumbing people down to make them subservient biological androids or replicants. That's what we're seen as. But now we're obsolete. We're to be phased down the new robotic systems, the drone aircraft, the drone submarines, the drone ships, the drone robots on the ground. We're all being conditioned, all being acclimated for this. Wow, that was amazing. And that's a good point too, that you've got some really good people that you talk to. You got Jerry oh, yeah. Griffin, you got Charlotte Isserby that we just saw in that clip. Yeah, I mean, she was a policy advisor for the U.S. Department of Education. I mean, anybody that's researched Charlotte knows that she really knows her stuff. Mm -hmm. And she pretty much spits it right out there and mm -hmm. says that, you know, our, our school has nothing to do with training us to be critical thinkers or, or to be right. independent and mm -hmm. self-reliant. It's, it's to train us to be a, a, you know, a gear in the machine, mm -hmm. uh, the globalist machine that, that's using us as resources so they, they literally farm our energy. In that way, and so uh, you, when you have somebody at her level and her experience and the, the, the years of wisdom that she has under her, that's just saying it as plain as day. It's it's really hard to the know, avoid the obvious fact of right. what she's saying. The deliberate so, dumbing down of America. Absolutely. And John Taylor Gatto was another guy that we cover in the movie that that really was a, a pioneer. Sure. Uh, you know, this guy really took you know, students who had been you know, given up on, you know, the system had given up on these kids, and he was able to turn them into top-level students. And, uh, you know, really, at one point, he realized the you know, hypocrisy of the system, that, you know, that they didn't want him to actually train these kids to be intelligent, critical thinkers. They, you know, we want to keep people dumbed down to a certain degree so they're more subordinative to control. He was teacher of the year for two years oh, yeah. running and, and they really came up him. That's yeah. right. And he famously resigned his position in the Wall Street Journal laying out all of the steps and what he found out since he started teaching the corruption and, and just the, the lack of the basic foundation of respect for the children empowering them to think versus actually suppressing their thinking. And um, the um, underground education and the history of that, Tragedy and Hope, Richard Grove, Lisa Arbacheski, excellent writers, researchers, producer with the film, Lisa did the voiceover. They got to know Mr. Gatto on a personal level and really studied his work. It's phenomenal. It's an, an incredible body of work. Can you imagine of having him and Charlotte Isabeet and like-minded individuals running our education system in the U.S. today would be phenomenal, one of the best in the world. Well, you know, people, it's not just education. It's so many different institutions we have. People think that it has, the public thinks that it has one function, when in reality, it has a very different function. Exactly. And that's never been more true of any institution than government schools. Absolutely. I mean, I grew up in government schools, as you know, most children did. And you're basically just, it's repetitive to, you know, train for these tests that are just about regurgitating useless facts. There are no classes in critical thinking and, and really uh, being creative. And, and ultimately, this country was founded on people being very creative and self-reliant. Mm -hmm. And slowly but surely, the education system that we have has bred that out of us to where now you have an epidemic of adults living with their parents well into their 40s in some cases. Yeah. because they d are not giving, given the basic skill set necessary to go out into the world and be a creative, positive force for humanity. And, and now they're sitting at home playing video games. That's right. Yeah, we see somebody famously said that education is not filling a bucket, but it's lighting a fire. Mm -hmm. But whenever a fire is lit in a student that's in a government institution, or even in private schools, they, because the private schools have their curriculum as well as their method of education mm -hmm. apes what is done in the government school. So, 
you know, when, you know, when you're in this rigid classroom environment, whenever a fire gets lit, it gets extinguished because you've got to move on. The bell rings, you go on to the next class. One of the things John Taylor Gatto used to say, you know, every 50 minutes the bell rings, you go do something completely different. You can't really ever focus on right. something. You just keep them scatterbrained. And it's, and it's designed that way intentionally. And, you know, I went through military basic training and mil military schools after that. And it's almost a, you know, more intense version of what public schools are. And everything is so regimented, you were never given an opportunity to make an autonomous decision for yourself. Every aspect of your life is micromanaged down to when you go take a break mm -hmm. and, and go to the restroom. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't want you ever having time to stop and, oh, I have a thought process. I can actually create ideas of my own. Mm -hmm. And, you know, John Rappaport in the film, you know, makes a great point that, you know, that's what the elites do is they try to convince you that you have no creative power. Mm -hmm. That way you look to them to mm -hmm. be the creative influence in your life and to provide the answers of how you're supposed to live your life. So when you go back and you look at the origins of mind control, and you look at the things that have been done for centuries, and especially, like I said, education we're talking about, it's so pervasive, so broadly applied, such a substrate of our civilization. But you also now talk about the more focused, more modern, more technological aspects of mind control, like uh, Operation Paperclip. Mm -hmm. And we've got a clip of that that we can show right now. Everybody around the State Department visa requirements get them into the country. Everybody knows about the race at the end of World War II to get Nazi scientists. The Russians wanted them, the United States and England wanted them. And the United States and England got most of them because the Nazis didn't want to go to the Soviet Union, another authoritarian system. They wanted to go to a, quote, freer system. And like an infection, they came to England, Canada, and the United States. and. It wasn't just over NASA and rocketry with Werner von Braun and Goddard and others. It was tens of thousands in mind control and torture and military science and surveillance. And the CIA got modeled to a great extent off of the Gestapo. And so we see really the evil of the Nazis being transplanted back to the United States and England where the eugenics philosophy that they had embraced had originally sprung. The Office of Strategic Services, the precursor of the CIA, under the direction of William Wild Bill Donovan and Alan Dulles, recruited Nazi scientists and aided their importation into America. Among them were rocket scientist Werner von Braun and the aeronautical physician Hubertus Strughold. The problem that the United States was facing was there was all these German scientists who were kind of in the wind, loose, wasn't clear where they were going to end up. And the uh, French, the British, the Russians, and the Americans were all trying to recruit them. The Germans had developed lots of different advanced weapons. And they'd also uh, done a lot of experimentation on human beings in the, in the uh, concentration camps. Uh, so they had a lot of medical data that we didn't have. We, they had, uh, of course, the rocket scientist and the airplane scientist and all the rest of it. And Paperclip was our version of going into Europe and finding these guys and bringing them to the United States to work. Wow. So now it's a very focused, very technological aspect of this. And a lot of people may have heard of Operation Paperclip, but I think the majority of people haven't. I mean, the aha moment for me was reading the Frank Olson book, uh, A Terrible Mistake, mm -hmm. where he was talking about, that was, he was talking about his involvement with the CIA mind control experiments and biological testing. He felt that had been a terrible mistake. That's one of the last things he said before right. he died. Well, uh, it was important that we put this aspect of, of mind control in the film, even though it doesn't deal directly with, you know, how it's influencing society, you know, directly in that way. Mm -hmm. it, what it shows is the, the level of research and, and money and time and energy that our government is putting into really focusing down on how to control us. You know, it shows what their agenda is and what their motivations are, mm -hmm. because it, it, if control wasn't on their agenda, it wasn't a part of their plan, they wouldn't be putting all of this time, 
resource and energy, and then going to such great lengths to cover it up after the fact. Uh, we go into the False Memory Syndrome Foundation in the film, where basically all these MK doctors get on a board and they all come together and basically say uh, all these patients of you know mind control, uh, you know victims of mind control, you know, all these memories that they have are false memories that you know were implanted by their <laughs> therapists and and things like this. And, and so you know it just kind of shows that not only are they doing all this research and, and putting all of their resources into it to get more information out about us, get more data that they can use to figure out how to control us better. You know, they're, they're going to great lengths to cover it up. And so, you know, any person with, you know, a critical mind that looks at the objective facts of that can tell that our governments have a very precise agenda of mm -hmm. control. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's going to really, as we were talking about before the interview, when we go over the news and people are coming at it from the perspective, from the background, from the mindset, worldview that's been given to them in the schools and in the mass media, even if we link to the actual government documents to show what's going on, in most cases they'll just reject that because it doesn't fit the paradigm that they've been living under. Absolutely. And I think the thing that really changes people's minds is when they have a documentary that really lays this out historically and you start from you know, the, the Middle Ages with Machiavelli essentially and bring it forward and show how there's been a deliberate effort to control the population. And these techniques have been, up to this point, broad and somewhat crude, but they're getting more and more refined and they can really focus that down to a, at an individual level. But there's a broader agenda as well, too. Absolutely. Right? Speak, yeah. speak to that. Yeah, um, you know, collectivism, exactly. right? I mean, that's mm -hmm. the ultimate agenda. Mm -hmm. What we're looking at, the ironic thing is, and uh, we try to point this out in the movie, is the advance of technology, quantum leaps uh, advance. And it, it actually can work in our favor because we can actually gather more information and for the folks that are empowered that they can use the critical thinking to say, hey, you know what, we, we can go back and study the historical context. What's going on today? We get this information fast enough, but what is good and what is bad information? And that's, it, I think it's a level of discernment and being able to sort things out is what we need to teach our children. Mm -hmm. They're not getting any of that all in, in public education. Private schools, possibly some, but uh, we find that even the homeschooling mm -hmm. is, is a good foundation because mm -hmm. you're really stepping out of this context mm -hmm. and saying, okay, this is the body of information we have. What, and again, what's good, what's bad, what's useful, and what do we want to teach our kids? Yes, absolutely. Well, like you said, all the information is out there. The technology is a two-edged sword, and it really is an info war, right? Exactly. And I, I think a really key fundamental tool in an info war is documentaries like the one you just produced. I'm really excited to see the rest of it. That's State of Mind. As I said, it's available now as a pre-book at the InfoWarsStore.com, and it will be releasing. What's the release date on that? Do you know? I think they're looking at uh, starting to get those out to the customers around the, the middle part of J July, July, I believe. Yeah. July 17th, okay. Mm -hmm. So you'll see that on the website if you go to InfoWarsStore.com. It's going to be available for the first several months exclusively at InfoWars. Well, that's it for tonight. We'll be back Monday night, 7 Central, 8 p.m. Eastern. Now you can watch The Alex Jones Show live as it happens at Infowars.com slash show. You'll find links to all of our content there and a free 15-day trial for Prison Planet TV. More than 60 movies and documentaries all in one place at Infowars.com slash show.